welcome to Worldview Apart, a podcast about the power of perspective in the 21st century. I am your host, Eric Garza, and as always, thank you for joining me. So spring has sprung here in the Green Mountain State of Vermont, and I got to say I am loving it after a long winter. I had a first time out uh, to do some full body sunbathing uh, a couple days ago, which was really nice. And, um, you know, we had a really long winter this year, so a lot of the wild edibles that I'm used to to uh, harvesting for the first time in April, I am just now starting to see in the early part of May. Also, I had the pleasure of taking a bunch of students of mine who were taking a traditional bowmaking class that I'm offering through the University of Vermont uh, down to Shelburne Farms to shoot some arrows. Last summer, you know, a friend of mine and I bought a log from Shelburne Farms, a bitter nut hickory log, and cut that log down into staves and put them up to start drying. And then the students in my bow making class this spring got to use those staves and uh, turn them into bows. So that was a lot of fun too. And we had a really nice window in terms of weather uh, the morning that we went out there, um, despite a rainy forecast. So last episode, uh, my guest Nate Hagen you know, mentioned his vision of the future, which involves what he calls the great simplification. You know, so Nate uh, is someone who studied energy systems and uh, monetary systems, finance, for a long time. So his views of why the great simplification is coming, you know, have a lot to do with energy scarcity and all the turmoil that will emerge uh, when our debt, you know, levels of debt can't continue expanding as they have in the past. Um, I also see a great simplification coming, and I see it coming for similar reasons. And today's episode is going to focus a little bit on one potential reaction to this, uh, minimalism, uh, which which goes by other names. You know, some people call it voluntary simplicity or um, simple living or, or what have you. Patrick Clark has long gravitated towards minimalism and many different ancestral health practices, although our podcast episode today is going to focus on uh, his interests in minimalism. He grew up in the Wayahuda Valley near the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and he kindled a lifelong interest in design while building his first debris huts there as a child. He continues to design minimalist furniture and outdoor gear. In this episode, Patrick and I talk about the turn of events that prompted him to transition away from the use of furniture and towards more minimalist lifestyle. Uh, We talk about how to make the transition to a more minimalist lifestyle and the physiological benefits of sleeping on the floor. We also talk about the benefits of cold exposure and the need to embrace environments that force our bodies to work, among other things. Uh, So with that, I will go ahead and cue up Patrick Clark in my conversation. I do hope you enjoy it. Patrick Clark, welcome to Worldview Apart. Thank you, Eric. It's good to be here. Great. So, you know, I've read a a bunch of the materials that you have uh, written about online, and you've got years and years and years worth of uh, articles that you uh, host on your website. And one of them in particular, I thought, would be a fun place to start. So you have an article called Deconstructing Sedentary, How to Outsmart Sitting. And in that article, you talk a little bit about your early transition uh, to avoiding furniture. You know, of course, you know, we both live in the United States. I live in Vermont, and you live in... Uh, North Carolina. And, you know, most people in this country love furniture, you know, for the comfort that it offers and the style and all that kind of stuff. And I wonder if we could kind of start our conversation um, by having you talk a little bit about what drew you to avoid um, furniture and, and some of the ways that that has impacted your life. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, I, uh, I was in high school and I, uh, it, it, it's kind of a long story and I'll, I'll try to be, you know, keep it, keep it concise, but it's important how I got there because it's kind of unusual. I was in high school, I was in ninth grade and I, I was watching, um, a documentary in, in my history class and, and it, and it showed, um, uh, Native Americans living in teepees and the Amer- U.S. Cavalry was, you know, trying to capture them and bring them, cap- bring them to the reservation and things. And, 
And um, and I had this like um, kind of an awakening where I I saw I all of a sudden I felt like I was like on the Indian side and and I and it hit me it hit me that that I was in this that something was really wrong. I was in this culture that 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 was supposed to be looking at things a certain way, looking at from the outside into the Native American culture, and and yet I felt like. I would rather be on the inside of that culture. And when that hit me, uh, it, it completely like blew my life into shreds. And I started questioning everything. I wanted to, to get rid of everything and like go back to that time. It just looked, that was, that was the kind of life that had, that would have meaning. And, and I was, um, I was, uh, I didn't realize I was just like in a state of like, you know, this this wasn't working for me. That's what's real, and this this is like crazy. What the way we're living, and so it sent me on a journey. I started questioning everything. Like, where did this come from? Like, why why do we do this? Why do we live in houses, not TVs? Why do we why do we uh, drive cars when we can walk? You know, it's more fun to walk. And and so that sent me on this long exploration journey that that became my life, and um. And uh, one of the first things that, well, probably the first thing I did was I, I learned how to make moccasins and I, and I don't know why, you know, why that first, but I knew, I knew I had to like change everything about my life and about how I think and about how I, how I, how I am as a human being on the planet. So I, I, the first thing I did, I knew I had to change my life and, and, and find a way to connect to that quality that I saw the Native Americans had in that video documentary. So I wore moccasins, I uh, made them, wore them to school. So I was like filling the earth. And, and then I was also um, getting rid of things. I, I wanted to, um, uh, I got rid of everything in my bedroom as far as furniture. And it became, it, it was, it was my, and there was no word for it at the time, but it, what it was, was it was the practice of what we call minimalism. And so I was getting rid of everything, getting, um, and so in getting, in getting rid of the furniture, then I was on the floor and a friend of mine had a, a futon shop and he showed me how to make a futon. So then I had a futon to sleep on and all of this stuff was, was just changing, uh, changing me. In, in way in a lot of ways and then um so that led to you know with no furniture like um there was uh there was uh a new there was moving and and le and but then i'd have to go to school and sit and then and then you know then i'd be free to move when i was back in my own space and eventually like decades later, you know, I went through high school, college, and then, and then I was found myself working in a, in a, um, company, a cottage industry making, um, meditation cushions. And, and, the, and then, and then that brought up this thing about sitting, like, why, why are we sitting on a meditation cushion anyway? Like, what does that mean? Like, why don't, uh, and for one thing, why do we sit on a chair or a meditation cushion. Why, if we sit on a meditation cushion when we meditate, why don't we sit on a meditation cushion when we're doing other things too? And so I had that question and I explored that. It took me like about a decade to to get some uh, headway on what that was about. And 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 what it was, it opened up the, the entire history of of kind of like civilization. <laughs> it's a huge aspect of civilization why we why we sit why we use our bodies the way we do and um and so uh over the next maybe decade after that i i uh started inventing ways of bringing that quality of sitting on a meditation cushion into everyday life that that's how i got into it and that and that 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 is what you i now call um you know i i had to invent things to make that happen because there wasn't even anything in existence that, that you could do that. You, you could live like that. 
there was a few there was like maybe a chair maybe two that were they were called like kneeling chairs or active sitting chairs um but they were they were kind of limited too because you get in them and you and you're kind of stuck in one position and and so um i i was like well this doesn't work well this this sucks i mean you have to sit i mean i i felt terrible sitting there i just i don't know i just started feeling like crap and i had no words for it and like i and it was kind of like in the beginning of the internet there was it was really hard to find any information about anything um but uh but it but event and then eventually a little later than that like maybe it took me two or three years after that and then i was like well i don't like sitting in this kneeling chair i don't really like sitting all the time even on the floor why don't i stand up like why can't i stand up i'm just I'm just using the computer. Why can't people stand up and use the computer? And and so I got some crates and boxes and I put my great big laptop. It wasn't even, it was before laptops. And and so, you know, how can I put my computer up so that I can uh, see it while I'm standing up? So I did that and then it was like crazy. It looked crazy. It was like extremely bizarre. No one had ever heard. There wasn't even a word for stand up desk. And, uh, and no one, you know, had heard of it. And, and so, uh, you know, I was promoting standing up. Eventually I developed a stand up, a pro product for a stand up desk and, and products for sitting med in meditation posture for doing computer work and, and, and some other products that I, that I now call the barefoot office kits. But, but at the time there, no one had heard of it. And, and as I, found out and started researching that I found out that they did used to do it in the past. Like people, especially they said in Germany that stand up desks were, and there was some presence, I think Thomas Jefferson, some presidents had used stand up desks. And, and so there was a precedent for it, but I had to rediscover it. I had to rediscover everything. I had to rediscover native Americans. And, you know, it was like, wow, like all this stuff that like people don't tell us. And if we knew, if we had this wealth of knowledge of all the possibilities, I mean, we wouldn't have to like rediscover it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. A lot of threads you just dropped that I, I'm intrigued to follow up on. But the one that I'm kind of drawn to first is um, kind of like the consumerist thread and how that ties in, you know, because uh, certainly you go to like, I don't know if you have this chain where you live, but you like an Office Max or a Staples or, or, office chains like that. And so much of the high value product they sell is, is office furniture of various sorts and, you know, big setups that you can buy to outfit like a cubicle and, and have like a rolling chair and all that stuff. And yeah, I, I feel like so much of our economy is built around furniture. You know, office furniture is one facet of that, but you know, other types of furniture too. And yeah, I, I guess it like, occurs to me that the U.S. economy would be so foundationally different if people's bodies were able to adapt to you know, doing the things that we want and need to do without having to purchase all this uh, furniture for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a really good point. Um, because like having our, our culture has evolved for several hundred years are kind of towards furniture. We used to be agrarian, you know, it, well, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we really didn't use furniture very much, you know, a hundred years ago, very few people were, were in the office and little by little it, it they started migrating to cities and to offices. And it, then, it, you know, the whole culture kind of got inside out. So, um, but uh, yeah, um, the when when we're when you grow up not using that furniture, it re, it shapes your body a certain way, and and not just your body, but you know your your brain and your uh, your metabolism and um, your circadian rhythms, your sleep. It it changes everything. It, it's a huge factor in in like what we call what we might we think of as nutrition, like the way food affects us, movement affects us that way too. And so um, right now, what, what we're looking at is like this crazy idea that 
that you know we we need stuff um uh if we if we could um if we didn't need that stuff if you could just do stuff with very few if you could function in your life without without using all these props that we call furniture um or fewer of them uh, it would be uh it would be a different thing. What we call, there is a movement for that now. It's called minimalism or downscaling or minimalism. And so, yeah, some people have, have turned on to this idea of like, get rid of stuff. What's, what's the least that I can, that I can use and, and be happy and have quality of life? What's the least? But, but most of America has been like, you know, what most I can have, what's, you know, what I need, I need, this to be happy i need this to be happy and and it's just this process of endless accumulation and trying to like satisfy our desires and kind of be unfulfilled in that way yeah and and you mentioned that you know growing up without furniture or even you know easing back to a lifestyle that doesn't include a lot of furniture changes our bodies and I wonder if you'd be willing to go into, you know, a little bit of detail on that, because I feel like that's the kind of topic that a lot of my inter- my listeners would be quite interested in. Like, what are, you know, if, if you take, I mean, I'll, I'll let you choose what you want to kind of focus on, but like if you choose an article of furniture, a chair or sofa or whatever that a lot of people tend to use, and you kind of take that out and invite people to live without that, like, how does that change Physiologically, how does that change people? Yes, that's that's the a good question. Um, well, first off, um, uh, back pain, you know, back pain and back injuries are a uh, huge problem in in the Western world. Um, Nine point one million dollars per year, or or is it billion? <laughs> I think it's billion, <laughs> and uh, is spent on problems around back pain. And and most of this is actually, I mean, who doesn't know or, or have injuries from like that or back pain? Yeah, um, I most don't, of, but that's, yeah. Yeah, you're like me. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but most people uh, are, you know, the, uh, their, sh- their bodies are shaped the way the chair, the chair has shaped us. You know, we, we become shaped by our, our culture, essentially. And basically it's, um, it, uh, it's called front. There are several words, front loading or, um, the, we're in a slump. We're in a constant slump because, um, the muscles in front are tighter than the muscles in, in the back of our body. And so, um, and so that, that puts us in a, in a, in a state of being out of alignment where our bodies are not in alignment. And you can see that, like, if you look at, at pictures of, native peoples like you know and old pictures or even some videos of native americans and how how incredibly elegant they they were and and how they moved with grace and their and and we know the word you know the phrase um as straight as an indian and and so you know <laughs> as slumped over as a white man you know like <laughs> so uh yeah so um that that's how it shaped us and and um and so when we are looking at that, well, what can we do about it? I mean, we're we're malleable. The human body is malleable, and it can change. And so, and so we need to re-educate our body about how to how to um, get back into our natural state of alignment. You know, I, I feel like in um, the ancestral health world, there are plenty of people talking about how detrimental sitting is. And like, if someone were to come to you and say, yeah, you know, I, I work, you know, and, and usually sit in a, sit at a desk for a good chunk of my day. And then I come home and I'm just exhausted and I want to sit down on my sofa and watch television or sit down in a chair and watch television. You know, if someone like that were to come to you and say, I would love to get these chairs out of my life, how do I do that? I mean, like certainly stand up desks at offices is, is, you know, a way to deal with that there. But like if you were to enter into someone's home and and invite them to consider practices that would alleviate the need for sofas and chair, like what kind of advice would you give someone? So 
the, I mean, we're dealing with, uh, you know, a couple of issues here. One is, is our culture and that, you know, you, you do have to fit in somehow with the way things are like I did when I was in ninth grade and I saw that documentary. And, and even though I wanted to be like those Indians living in the teepee, but I had to deal with, you know, well, you know, here I am like, you know, what do I do? Um, so, I mean, there's, um, at the office, uh, let's just let's just start with the home because like let's just say the office um you know that you know you you can't exactly maybe you can make some minor changes there you can get a stand up desk and you can get a a chair that that is an active sitting chair so you could maybe do active sitting which is sitting that means active sitting means sitting where you're not in a chair in a like leaning back in a right angled chair uh, active sitting is where you're kind of like perching and and so, and it puts your back your spine in alignment so it's it's the next close thing to standing yes. so you you can maybe you know tweak your your office and and if you can get a stand up desk and a and an active sitting desk and but at home but the thing is so then you go home and you're tired and you you're like yeah but i i can't like sit like this because I'm, I'm exhausted. I've been working all day and I'm not going to go active sitting. Well, first off, let's just talk about why are you exhausted? You're exhausted because you, your energy has been cut off from that way of using your body at the office. And, and so, and so, um, so, uh, let's see. So I would say that, um, well, of course, we know that. We know the problem. The problem is your your energy is getting cut off because of the way you're sitting and using. You're not breathing. You're not um, you're not using your body. So your your um, metabolism is like falling, and so you're going to have like no energy. So uh, I would uh, the best way to um, deal with it, in my opinion, is to is to um, I, I'm just going to like go hardcore here and, you know, everyone's going to have to tweak it according to, you know, what, what their, what their situation is. But I would recommend if you can to actually get rid of your furniture and kind of start over or at least do a re a rehaul and, and reassess what, what your furniture is, is doing and how, and how you can um, change it out with what I call body friendly furniture, which is furniture, which, is conducive to health, energy, and alignment. So I would um, get rid of your furniture, get rid of your bed, get rid of your couch, and maybe uh, you know you might change out some chairs and keep your dining table, or you might not. You might sit on the floor and and dine on the floor. So um, uh, it's okay. It's okay to um, sit at a table because you're not going to sit there all the time. It's okay to. That's like a position that's that can be good if you just use it part of the time and you use the floor part of the time. But if you if you uh, leave all your furniture and and you just like make a commitment, oh, I'm going to like sit on the floor and uh, well, the problem is that um, you end up not doing it first off the furniture is in the way and there's not enough room to space in the house to kind of like have the furniture and the floor lifestyle so i i would encourage people to to think about adapting a floor sitting and sleeping lifestyle yeah and kind of like talking about the floor you know you sleep on the floor you mentioned that in some of your articles and i actually sleep on the floor as well um you know most people, I think, would assume that this is detrimental, you know, for all kinds of reasons. What are the physiological benefits as you understand them to sleeping on the floor, you know, maybe relatively hard surfaces? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, um, so what I discovered is that, is that it, it, um, the, Floor actually enhances sleep, but again, we're not adapted to it. So it's so most people can't just start sleeping on the floor cold turkey, but but floor enhances sleep by um, it puts us in alignment because when you sleep on a bed, you you sag down in it, and that puts you in the same uh, shape that you are when you're slumped over in a right angled chair, and so um, so it so sleeping on the floor puts us in alignment. 
And that can feel uncomfortable because, because our bodies aren't shaped that way at the time. So, and the, the other thing sleeping on the floor does is that it, it increases the breathing, uh, the lung capacity and the oxygen intake because your, your chest, your upper body, your, your breathing apparatus is now opened up as if you were doing yoga. And so you're going to be breathing deeper. And as you breathe deeper, your brain waves are going to go more into the sleep zone where you can go into deep sleep. And, um, and then the other thing, so that's two things the the third thing is that the sleeping on the floor is also going to, um, sublex your fly, your spine, it sublex your spine, because as you breathe, it expands your lungs and that pushes on your spine. And as you breathe in and out, in and out, your, your spine is constantly being sublexed. And then through that, uh, it, you, you know, you're getting this treatment, this like um, kind of chiropractic treatment, very gentle, and and it allows your body and all, not just your spine, but all your joints to to uh, readjust, realign. And you know, in your experience, you know, working with people, how long does it typically take someone to kind of adjust? To the idea, not not to the idea, but to the actual act of doing of, of sleeping on the floor. You know, is that like a one week transition? Is it a one month transition? Is it a longer term transition? That varies a lot, a very lot. Like sometimes people like try it and then they go back to their bed for months and then they go back to the floor and then that's it for the bed. And you know, sometimes people try it and. And they're just, that's it. The floor is forever. And some people, uh, uh, you know, all different variations of things because we, we have all different conditions. And, and, um, and so I would say that a, a good way to transition is to, is to um, get some body work because like the, the problem with the transition is that the body is like kind of bent over. And so it can't straighten out when you lay on your back on, on a firm surface. So your body's not straightening out, you know, without feeling tight and uncomfortable. And that's what's the problem with sleep. So it, it really doesn't take much um, body work to, to start to loosen that up. And it's going, it's going to be a process of um, body work, sleep on the floor, and don't sit in a chair, stand and do all the, the various um, positions that, that I teach people. Um, because if you go sit in a chair, you're going to keep retightening your body. And then so it's this kind of like loop where you need you need to kind of change your entire life. And you can't just change half of it because you'll, you'll be loose in one half and tight in the other half. And like, are there particular, you know, you mentioned some movements, are there particular movements that people can practice to kind of get their body limbered back up again? Yes, yes, there are. Um, that, uh, it's uh, just, you know, kind of any basic y yoga, very simple yoga um, cla uh, routine. They're, 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 they're all very balanced and um, gentle and they and they they work with you incrementally um so so yoga has a lot a, a lot to offer there and and other other movement disciplines are, are good too um uh so yeah i would i would do uh yoga stretching and but the thing is you can't just stretch and go back into into your um poor use problems and that's that's the that's the the, the thing that that I that I'm adding here is like that we don't just go and do yoga and then just like ignore the rest of our life. We integrate that that whole idea and the whole body awareness in into the into our lives. Yeah, yeah. And also, I would say um uh just like an in, inversions inversions inverting inversion machines and uh, uh, slings that you can decompress your spine are good. Um, and also, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay. Um, so, 
you know, you know, you and I are talking about sleeping on the floor, and so some I, I imagine some of my listeners are imagining the two of us like literally lying down on a hardwood floor, or you know, it, it's my bedroom happens to have a hard floor, hardwood floor. I don't know what yours is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is is that what you do, or do you have like some kind of a thin mattress or pads or something that you use to kind of give a little bit of cushion between yeah. you know whatever the flooring is and and your physical body? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of cushion is is excellent. Um, uh, you know, re- I think ideally about a half inch, uh, uh, you know, a half inch to an inch of of, of a firm type of uh, uh, material, like uh, like um, wool felt is good, um, or just any kind of blanket quilt type thing that that's folded over to give you a little a little bit of padding, and. And um, there is, uh, you know, there is kind of you. You can go very extreme and sleep on just bare wood. I mean, that's you can do that. It's totally possible. And and uh, you know, I don't think I would do it personally. I mean, I've done it in the in the summer. Um, it's not. Um, I there's a Japanese um, health guy. His name is Nishi, and he and he promoted this whole idea about firm surface sleeping and and he and there's a board called a Nishi sleeping board that's like kind of a soft wood that that you can put on your bed or something um so i but no for 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 most people like if you can get a half inch or an inch of of something firm like wool felt then that that's pretty much gonna help um that's going to give you uh the pretty much maximum benefit of the firm surface. Yeah. And that's actually pretty much what I use. So I, I uh, was inspired, you know, after our, our last phone conversation, before we got back together to record, and actually measured um, how thick the the padding that I sleep on is, which is basically um, four fairly thick wool blankets uh, folded over each other. And it ends up being about a half inch thick, uh, which... <laughs> For me, it feels like a pretty nice amount of padding. I mean, it's firm, so my body kind of like relaxes onto it, and I feel all the fascia kind of letting go as I'm lying down and relaxing and getting ready to fall asleep. Uh, But at the same time, it's not like so soft and mushy that I like mush into it, which I really, really dislike that feeling now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 is that's pretty much what you're describing is the is the effect that I'm looking for, and and you'll know because it it should be firm enough that you can you can feel like I can hear like within about two or three minutes of laying down, I I I like feel like a snap in in my vertebra, a yeah. couple of snaps, you know, and it's like they're they're like getting getting uh, stretched out again, and. And, um, you know, it's crazy. It's co- so crazy to think that we've been, you know, like locked up all this time. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I thought about that. I mean, I, I, it's been really literally decades since I've slept on a bed over the longer term. I think I had a bed when I was, um, you know, up until maybe the year 2001. And so 2001 was pretty much the last year that I slept on a bed on a, on a regular basis. You know, when I go back and visit family, I'll sleep in a bed because that's what they have. Um, but other than that, I've, I've done various floor sleeping arrangements. And I've been, one of the things that really astonishes me is that I'm 41 now. And, you know, I, I'm still pretty active in martial arts. You know, I've done various arts in the past. Nowadays, I, I busy myself with boxing. But I've been amazed, even at the age of 41, how easy it has been for me to maintain my flexibility and liberness and balance, um, you know, in the face of aging. Whereas I have a lot of friends, even friends who just really diligently and religiously do yoga and yet are having a much harder time, you know, maintaining their physical bodies as they age. And I... I um, I, I liken a lot of the the benefits of that to the fact that I just avoid sleeping on those soft surfaces and kind of give myself my body a good reason to like really relax all the different muscles and and kind of re re you know find its alignment every evening you know whereas a lot of other people you know their lifestyles are arranged in such a way that they just don't have that 
Yeah, yeah, it's huge. If you think about it, I mean, you know, first off, your you know alignment is huge, and then um, and and then uh, you know sleeping, like breathing, oxygenating your blood, and and sleeping well is huge. I mean, it'll it'll make a a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, an acquaintance of mine spends time in Africa every year. He visits the San Bushmen. Um, he's big into animal tracking and things like that. So he goes there like through Ecotourism International, I think is the one that organizes the trip. And, um, you know, spends time with them and learns to animal track and, and interpret bird language and things like that. And one of the things he's always come back and talked about is how, you know, a lot of these sand bushmen will make a fire in the evening and they'll just go and sit by the fire and talk by the fire. And then as the, as the night goes on, you know, they'll put a few more logs on the fire and then they'll just lie down on the bare ground next to this fire and fall asleep. And then, you know, they wake up the next morning, you know, having basically slept on hard ground. And, and yeah, I mean, they have, uh, you know, fairly healthy people, you know, considering that they live in a very marginal area of the Kalahari Desert. But, but yeah, I mean, that was one of the things when I learned about that years and years and years ago that inspired me to investigate, you know, how they did this, because obviously that is what people have been doing for much, much longer than we've been sleeping on beds. And our bodies are apparently evolved for that because certainly they, they would have, you know, the, the, the beds are something that people's bodies are evolving to now, you know, slowly or, or, you know, maybe, you know, poorly, but. Yeah, that, that is, um, that I call that, um, you know, that's what, if we could rewild our, ourselves and be, and be able to do that, be able to exist outside of all these things that we, we have to surround ourselves by this bubble of, of civilization that insulates us from nature and the elements and our bodies. And, and then, um, so it, it's liberating to be able to, to do that because you just, you just realize, my God, I like, I'm free. I mean, I, I can like, go anywhere, do anything, anytime. I'm like, you know, I don't, I'm not dependent on lugging around, you know, civilization everywhere I go, all these buildings with climate control, these insulated, um, you know, it has to be 70 degrees if it, if it can be too cold or too hot, our bodies can't adapt to, to the temperatures. Uh, we can't adapt to like surfaces. Like we're just like dead. So, um, so yeah, that is that is a that's a really a, it's good to see examples of people native peoples doing that and uh, and give us some inspiration. Yeah, and you and you say like we're dead, but I don't know if I would characterize it quite that way. I mean, to me, it just feels like people have become just extraordinarily fragile. You know, they they just require all these accoutrements in order for them to. Um, you know, do anything remotely close to thriving. And it just seems to me like it's so much easier to build a good life for myself if part of the effort that I'm expending is to, to kind of make it so that my body still has like a high level of adaptability. So I don't need, you know, a bed. Like I um, helped a friend, a couple friends move earlier this year. And, uh, you know, moving a couple, a man and a woman from one house to another, just a couple blocks away was a huge ordeal because <laughs> I mean, they, even though there's just two people, I mean, they literally filled this gigantic moving truck. And of course, you know, I'm physically strong, which, which is useful because both of them have severe back problems and they couldn't lift a lot of the heavy things that they owned. But, um, but yeah, just like huge pieces of furniture and huge beds and you can take them apart to some degree, but it's it's still an ordeal, you know, and, and big, heavy mattresses. Whereas, you know, it's been a couple of years since I've had to move. But when I move, if I didn't own the chest freezer that I have to store meat in, you know, from hunting season, I could probably fit everything I owned in like a decent sized uh, hatchback sedan or like a wagon. And when I moved to Vermont from Indiana, everything that I owned was in a small sedan, you know, this was before I got my chest freezer. So like the benefits of not depending on furniture and a big fancy bed is that, you know, there's really not a lot of heavy stuff to move. You know, not that I'm against lifting heavy things. You know, I think there's 
a lot of value in being able to do that. But yeah, yeah, there's a there's also a, the you know huge psychological benefit of of not having that stuff. Um, you know, in feng shui, the science of feng shui, um, they they the goal is to have like just what you need and not not excess, and and that it frees up. Um, it just frees you up to be, to have your mind focused on the things that you really need to be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I know, and I, I feel, um, you know, I feel like people, people often, uh, apologize <laughs> for, for all the stuff. Some, they see me and, you know, I, I often get like a funny reactions, like guilt and, you know, like, you know, they feel guilty for how I don't, I don't say anything, you know, nothing, never. I mean, but, you know, it's up to you what you want to do, but, uh, you know, people just feel a little self-conscious because, you know, especially like you say, when you help someone move and they obviously see how you live and, the, you know, it seems kind of like this contrast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like a very, very stark contrast. Yeah. Another, another thread that you kind of brought up that I wanted to go back to is the temperature thing. Um, I mean, that's another thing that I've, I've gotten into, mainly for the health benefits of it, but like cold exposures and heat exposures. So, you know, going, spending time in a sauna each week, a few times a week. Um, and then uh, I, I, I have a membership at the YMCA among some of my other athletic, you know, endeavors. And they have a, a sauna there, so I, I can get access to that. And then, you know, I live up in, in northern Vermont, so it's cold a good chunk of the year and the, you know, we're starting to see leaves on trees now, but Link Champlain is still 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And a friend of mine and I went down and went for a swim, you know, just yesterday. And, um, and I've been, you know, interested in cold exposure probably since about 2005 or six. So more than 10 years at this point. And just the, the degrees of freedom that I get from that kind of a practice has been unexpectedly huge. I mean, I've gotten to a point now where even living in northern Vermont, I have no use for a winter coat or gloves anymore, which surprises a lot of people because living in northern Vermont, a lot of people, you know, have two or three different big heavy coats and, you know, various kinds of gloves and other things. But that's like another area where I feel like the human body is capable of just a huge range of comfort. But because of the way that people live, we allow a lot of that range to atrophy, you know, down to this very narrow, you kind of articulate it as like, you know, 70 degree, you know, temperature range. And yeah. surely there are physiological impacts that go along with that, it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is amazing that you, that you do that. That's, that's very, uh, very good to, to go that extreme. And, and, uh, and I have, yeah, I have to explore that, um, in the past several years. And, um, and it is, it's extremely important because that's part, part of the problem is that our bodies have become adapted to these, these environments that don't require us. They, they don't have resistance. We, our body has to do nothing. Yeah. When we sit, we sit in a chair, we do nothing. We we have uh, you know over insulated everything, and 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 the the air is always the same. And we do nothing. Our body has to do nothing. And then when you go, do get exposed to hot or cold, then your body has no idea. Well, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and you feel and you feel miserable and uncomfortable. So um, so uh, I would say that that the cold, cold exposure, I mean, heat, heat exposure kind of is natural to cold, you know, if you're going to get cold then you also kind of like the heat kind of counteracts the, the cold, like you say, with the sauna. And, um, uh, yeah, I would, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, if, if someone lived, uh, oh, you know I, I want to, I want to add something to this. Go ahead. I was just thinking, um, so, uh, it comes in handy, this, uh, be getting your body, uh, cold adapted. It can come in handy because you can easily find yourself in a survival situation. And, um, one time I, uh, you know, I kind of took a, had a test of my, of all my different, like minimalists philosophies. Um, I got kind of locked outside of my hotel room 
and 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 it, you know i was like there was only the lobby and um but i didn't have anything like no no bedding no you know i was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and it was air conditioned in in the hotel and uh, it was it was cold i was cold i didn't think i could sleep you know on nothing no no surface at all but i but i laid down and and uh and it was like um, I fell asleep. I was shivering like crazy, even though I was shivering, cold, hard surface, you know, like not a good place to sleep. I fell asleep and I slept, you know, I slept fine. Yeah. So I, and and I mean, my shivering stopped like it. I my shivering. I mean, I was asleep when it stopped. So I didn't notice when it stopped. But eventually, because when I woke up, I wasn't shivering. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like another practice that I pushed myself to adopt and then eventually became something that was very comfortable for me is, is always making sure that I'm a little bit cold. I mean, in the middle of the summer, I can't do that because it's warm outside and, and there's nothing that I can do to change that. But certainly in the wintertime, you know, I, I leave my window open pretty much all year. Um, you know, like when it gets like 10 below zero, I probably close it. But other than that, I've got my window open at least a little crack. And then I um, kind of disciplined myself so that I never use more than one blanket and like my bed sheet. So a lot of the year I'm going to to sleep in like the 50 degree air temperatures and just kind of like relaxing into that coldness and letting myself fall asleep. And I have never slept better in my life than I have over the last couple of years when I've pushed myself to do this. And I, I say pushed myself because initially it was a little bit of a push. But now it's not a push at all anymore. You know, now yeah. my body has that kind of feeling of being a little bit cool, but there's no shivering. Um, and I fall asleep really easy and I sleep really, really well. Yeah. And it's yeah. hard for me to imagine doing it any different at this point. You know, yeah, obviously exactly. it'll get hot in the summertime and I won't be able to do that because, you know, it'll be 80 degrees out. But yeah. Yeah. And, and that and that, that's really cool. And that 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 is a parallel to my experience. And I I um. I, uh, one, you know, a few years ago, I, I finally lived out my TP dream that I had from way back in high school. And I, and I moved into a TP and I, and it was, it was scary. It was really scary to be like, I'm going to be in this cold. I mean, it was like the, you know, this was like the beginning of my cold exploration days. And I, and I was like, you know, at first I was like, really nervous about it. And then, um, and then I, after doing it and, and being in the winter in a TP, it was like, I got, I got to, to like really love it. It was, it was very amazingly, uh, nurturing and uh, peaceful and calming. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. I can totally see that. So, um, you know, if, if someone came to you, you know, having heard this podcast or maybe, you know, found your website and read a lot of your stuff and said, yeah, you know, I've been living in this life of furniture, you know, temperature controlled comfort for my whole life. And now I want to transition into something different. You know, I'm ready to step out of my comfort zone. What do I do? Where do I start? You know, what kind of advice uh, might you give someone who kind of comes to you with, with that sort of a request? I would, um, the way I do it is I, I focus, I take, um, a focus of, uh, circadian rhythms. Like if you just look at what you can do to, to, um, balance your circadian rhythms, then that will take care of, of kind of everything else or give you a guiding light to, to making the transition. And so that, that would be, um, diet the diet, which is appropriate to your climate zone. That means foods that grow in your climate and help you help your body and your metabolism to, to thrive in that climate and, uh, to, uh, light so that you're, you're going to bed early and wake, you know, waking up early so that you're following the light cycles of the season that you're in not using artificial light uh, using artificial light mindfully so that you're, you're not overusing it and you're shielding yourself, um, uh, using blue blocker glasses or something like that. So, um, and then temperature, uh, where you are exposing yourself to the temperatures to, 
directly and getting a good, a really good dose of, of cold, um, at least, you know, three times a week, but uh, always keeping your, your house on, on the cool side. So, um, so that your body has to have some resistance. It has to work. You, you, you want to make your body work. And, um, so yeah, we got diet, uh, light, um, t- temperature. And what was the third one? Uh, magnetism, <laughs> like, uh, being, exposing yourself to, to the earth's electromagnetic field, protecting yourselves from EMFs, um, our artificial EMFs that are, that are, they're actually interfering with your, your body's adapting to the Schumann resonance, which is the earth's uh, pulse heart rate, eight, uh, 7.83 Hertz frequency. Um, so you have to mitigate your electricity wiring and where you live. I mean, if, you know, of course, if you can <laughs> live in the ideal place, that's great. Uh, otherwise you need to do some remediation of, of all the, um, pathogenic electromagnetic frequencies that are happening. So that there's four, those are four, um, four uh, dimensions that we need to pay attention to. Yep. And so the, the kind of reduction of furniture would come after all of those. Oh, actually, um, uh, actually that, that's a fifth dimension. Yeah. Movement. So, um, so yeah, movement because, um, because actually if the way it fits in is because when, when you move, it stimulates your metabolism. So m- like moving is one way of generating heat for your body, like, like eating like certain foods, like fats, uh, so, you know, the fats with, uh, that burn into heat instead of carbohydrates, which don't create heat. Like movement also is one of the things that stimulates metabolism and heat. So getting, getting rid of your furniture and your bed so that you're, so you're building into your lifestyle movement. You, you don't, you don't just like, like think, Oh, I need to like do movement. You, you're just, you do movement. You just do it. It's just a part of your, of your lifestyle. And that means that you get, when you sleep or sit on the floor, you have to get down and you have to get up. So that movement stimulates metabolism and, and uh, um, among all the other health benefits as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, as, as you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the martial arts that I've trained in over the years, um, including like Japanese or Eastern style, as well as boxing, you know, they rely pretty heavily in training on movements that are basically ways of getting up and getting down onto the ground. So like various kinds of rolling, squatting, you know, Turkish get-ups, all that sort of thing. And I just see a lot of benefit in those, even if you're not interested in like martial arts or boxing. Yeah, yeah exactly. That That's a very good, uh, very good place to start. And and these are all like ancient traditions of people who, who still know how to use their bodies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Um, let's see. And I, I wanted to say, um, about the, um, about, about that, what would I recommend people do? And then I, I went into circadian rhythms and focus on circadian rhythms. And, and then, um, let's see, I, I would also say, um, to, uh, l- let's just add another thing. There was movement, there was all those things and movement, but then there's also, um, uh, detoxing the body and I mean, detoxing your environment. So get, getting rid of all the things that are, that are emitting, uh, harmful chemicals into, into your water and your air and your food and that are surrounding you. So getting rid of, getting rid of them in your, in your surrounding environment and, and also then detoxing them out of your body. Because if you have these, these, um, thousands of, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in your body and, and you can go and do all these other things and they're great, but, but you're still going to be, uh, fighting an uphill battle. So we really need to be, uh, thinking about detoxing. Okay, cool. Yeah. And all of those are like two hour episodes by themselves. So yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah. Do you have a, uh, social media presence or web presence that you'd like to share with my listeners before we finish up? Sure. Yeah. Um, my, my website is, uh, paleo all the And, uh, and I have, I have, uh, written extensively about these things that we've talked about there. So I'd love to meet you all over there. And also I'm on Facebook under Patrick Clark. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick Cluck, for uh, coming on the podcast. Thank you, Eric. I enjoyed it. Great. So there you have it. Uh, That's the conversation that I had with Patrick Clark. Uh, If you have an interest in following up on any of the links or resources that Patrick or I mentioned, you can do that most easily by heading to the page that is dedicated to this episode on my website. So head over to ericgarza.info, click on podcast in the main menu, and then scroll down until you find this episode. And then you'll find a bunch of links and resources there. And last but not least, before I wrap things up, I want to send some gratitude out to the Montreal-based band Crowfoot for letting me use their tune, Good Day Miss Iris, to open up the episode. The tune was written by Adam Broom, and it was performed by Adam, James Trudell, and Nicholas Williams. The band does not perform together very much anymore, but if you are interested in learning more about them and figuring out how to purchase some of their CDs, you can find all that information at their website, which is crowfootmusic.com. So that is all for this episode of A Worldview Apart. Uh, Again, thank you for listening. This is Eric Garza, your humble host of A Worldview Apart, signing off. Take care, and I will talk to you again soon.